Hey, it's Matthew Matt here, and today I want to talk to you about some math in the news. I saw this opinion piece in the New York Times about testing the coronavirus, um, and I want to talk to you about the math behind it in an understandable way. A big part of the work I do is to develop math problems about things that matter in our world. For example, I have lessons on income inequality and school segregation. So I've been wanting to do some videos about teaching that kind of math. And when I saw this article, I thought it would be a good place to start. Before we jump into the math, we do need to go over a little bit of information about the coronavirus and antibody testing. This information comes from the Center for Disease Control, or the CDC, and I'll put the link in the description below. First off, what is an antibody? Antibodies are proteins that our bodies use to help fight off infection, infections, in this case to fight off the coronavirus. After fighting off an infection, there are still antibodies left behind in your blood. So an antibody test, an antibody test checks for these to see if you've ever had the virus. Now it's important to know that an antibody test may not find antibodies in someone who is recently infected. So if you just caught the coronavirus, your body may not have had time to make the antibodies yet. So why do we care about antibody testing? For a few big reasons. First, we really need to know how many people have had have been infected by the virus to understand how it spreads and um, how it works. Second, testing and tracking the spread of the coronavirus is going to be a really important part of reopening the economy. And third, it's possible that if you've had the coronavirus once, then you might be immune in the future. Now, I put might in bold caps here because scientists have really not had enough time to figure this out for sure either way. I'm not an uh, epidemiologist, but from what I've read, many scientists suspect that you will be immune for at least a while if you've had the virus before, but we just haven't had enough time to study this since the coronavirus is so new. All right, so let's get back to the article. The headline says, just because you test positive for antibodies doesn't mean you have them. So they're concerned about the idea that people might get the test, the test says you have antibodies, and they think, okay, I'm safe, I'm immune, and that might not be true. In the subheading, it says, in a population whose infection rate is 5%, a test that is 90% accurate will deliver a false positive nearly 70% of the time. That's a lot to unpack, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, this is by Todd Howe and Sunil Betty, researchers who study judgment and decision making. All right, so let's jump in. I'm going to show this box here. This box represents one person. And I'm going to add some more people, so now we have a total group of 20 people. As a reminder, the subheading of the article said, in a population whose infection rate is 5%, da 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 da. I want to focus on this 5% part. Um, the article actually points out that estimates for the infection rate in the U.S. range from anywhere between 5 to 15 percent, but they use 5 percent for their example, and that's what I'm going to do. Another way of saying this is that one out of every 20 people have had the coronavirus, which looks like this. That one darker red square on the bottom represents someone who's had the virus. All right, to think about this problem, we're going to want to imagine more than 20 people. So I can add another 20 people, so now we have 40 total. Uh, now we have 60, 80, 100, and I'm going to keep adding groups of 20 until we're up to 400 people total. And you can see I kept along the bottom, one out of every 20 people still has the coronavirus, or has had it at some point. So we've got 400 people here, 380 of whom have never had the virus, and 20 of whom have had it. We're going to start with these 380 people who have never had the virus. The article talks about a hypothetical test that's 90% accurate. Another way to say that, sorry, here's the quote from the article, another way to say that is that the test is wrong one out of every 10 times. So let's take a group, uh, look at a group of 10 people um, from here. The first person gets tested and it comes back as saying you never had the virus. The second person gets tested and also comes back negative. Um, and similarly for nine of the people in this group. But for one of the people in the group, this test is going to say they had the coronavirus even though they never did. This is called a false positive. Of course, it may not always be the last, the tenth person you test. I'm just putting it as the last tenth person here to keep things organized. Um, so if we look at the next group of ten people, the same thing is going to happen. Nine of them will be correctly identified as having never had the virus, but one of them is going to be a false positive. If we continue testing this whole group, we're going to end up with all these false positives, you know, one out of every 10 people. In total, we end up with 38 false positives and 342 correct or true negatives. And we're going to focus on the positives today, and they'll be, become more clear as we go why we're going to do that. 
I'm going to put X's in all these boxes to show that they're false positives. The test thinks these people had the coronavirus, but in reality, they've never had it. And to keep things organized, I'm going to move these people over to the right just so they're all together. All right, now let's look at the 20 people who have had the coronavirus. Remember, the test is wrong one out of 10 times. So if we look at these 10 people, it's going to incorrectly tell us that one of them never had the virus. This is a false negative. And again, if we look at the second group, we're going to get the same thing, one more false negative. So to keep things organized, I'll slide this one over. And so we can see that we have 18 correct positives, the 18 red boxes, and two false negatives, those green boxes with X's in them. All right, so as a reminder, we have, oh, let me go back a minute. As a reminder, we have 400 people total. We've got 380 who have never had the coronavirus and we've got 20 who've had it. As a reminder, the article's title is just because you test positive for antibodies doesn't mean you have them. They're worried people are gonna think they're safe or immune when they're really not. So that's why we're really only interested in the positive tests. Uh, these are people who got that they took the test and says, hey, yeah, you have antibodies, and they're thinking to themselves, all right, I'm in good shape. So let's take a look at those and talk about them. We have 56 total positive results, 38 of them are false, the ones with the X's going up and down, and 18 of them are true, the ones without the X's going along the bottom there. So if the test tells you that you have antibodies, what is the chance you actually do? Now you might already see part of the problem. There are way more false positives, way more boxes with X's than there are without. Um, so if the test says you have antibodies, it's probably wrong. To figure out the rate, we can just do 38 false positives divided by 56 total positives, and that's about 68%. So when they talk in the article about a nearly 70% um, false positive, that's what they're talking about. So in this hypothetical example, if the test says you have antibodies, then it's wrong 68% of the time and right only 32% of the time. Remember, this was just an example. Some of these variables really matter. So first is the accuracy of the tests. Uh, more accurate tests help, but to be clear, and as they point out in the article, they can't really solve the underlying issue. If there are lots of people who have never been affected, then there are always gonna be lots of false positives, even with more accurate tests, although they do help. As a reminder, in this example, um, they said the test was 90% accurate. That was the assumption. The other really big variable is what percentage of the population has actually had the coronavirus. In the article they mentioned, it looks like right now in the US, it's somewhere between five and 15% of the population. In our example, along with the 90% accurate test, we said, we're gonna assume 5%. And that gave us this 68% chance of the test telling us, hey, you have antibodies when you really don't. If that changes, if we say, oh, we think 15% of the population has, the, uh, has had the virus, then that lowers that incorrect false positive to 39%. That's a lot better, but it's still not great. Um, finally, please remember that we don't know for sure about whether antibodies keep you safe, or if they do keep you safe, how long, how long that means you're immune for. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. All right, I hope that helps shed some light on the math behind this opinion piece. Again, the link to the article and the CDC source I used are in the description below. Please send me your questions about this or any other math topics at mathematfk at gmail.com. My friend Sean made me a great theme song, so I'm going to finish with that. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Math's not a problem with Mathy Math. Math.